All right, ladies, let's get started. First of all, I want to say congratulations on your win yesterday. I saw you guys fight hard. At that first game lasted about, it seemed like. You still had some gas in the tank in order to get through that second game, so congratulations. I like the direction that you guys are heading in. So I'm pretty sure you guys have been seeing me around with my phone, taking pictures and the camera. So my name is Perry White. I'm the media director for the athletic department here. So my job here is to try to market and brand you guys so everybody can see what you're doing here, including those two victories yesterday, correct? Yes, sir. All right, so today you guys are in for a treat. You got a very special guest that's here. Now I'll do a slight introduction for him. I won't say too much, but there's a lot to say about him. His name is Roger Cato, former Southern University head baseball coach. And on this past Friday, he was just recently inducted into the National College Baseball Hall of Fame. So that is a huge honor, but it wasn't just your first Hall of Fame, right? In about five Hall of Fames, uh, he's in the Southern University Hall of Fame, uh, the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, in which you went in. You guys know who Peyton Manning is? Do y'all? Uh, I thought y'all was going to say no. Okay, so somebody been paying y'all watch a little football. So he went in with Peyton Manning. I think they said you might have got just as many votes or maybe a little bit more than Peyton Manning. I don't know what that's yeah, saying. Yeah, right. That's what they're saying. Uh, also, the American College Baseball Hall of Fame, the SWAC Hall of Fame, and most recently the National College Baseball Hall of Fame. He went in with a former player of his, Ricky Weeks. Ricky uh, was a special talent to this day. He still holds the NCAA batting average in all of college baseball and was the Golden Spikes Award winner. So he won uh, the best baseball player in America, played right there under him. Uh, 14 SWAC championships, 13 SWAC Coach of the Years, and as well as 11 NCAA tournament appearances. One of his teams in 1987 uh, as Southern being an HBCU, a historically black college, was the first HBCU uh, to upset the number one team in the nation in the regional, and that was Cal State Fullerton. So if you follow baseball, that was not a light feat. It was a heavyweight feat. So I watch you guys cheer the dugout. So let's give them a big round of applause. To <laughs> All well, I would say, ladies, he kept saying guys. I see only beautiful ladies in here, and one guy. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to call you guys. We're going to call you ladies, okay? <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, that's what you want to be called and recognized as. Am I correct? Yes. So, uh, listen, uh, <clears throat> it was a surprise call. This happened so quickly. I got a call on yesterday. Coach Shreya and uh, uh, Mr. White called me, and... Uh, he wanted to do it on a practice, and I said, no, I want to do it in a, class, in a room. <clears throat> There's a reason. Having coached for so many years, you have more control, less distraction. When you're in this kind of setting, our doors, a bird could fly, a plane, a car could spin, somebody could yell, and it could take away your concentration. And you play a sport that requires a tremendous amount of concentration simply because it's loaded with failure. Softball, like baseball, is a sport that is loaded with failure, disappointment, heartaches. And this is why the game is designed for those who are mentally strong, that can understand, no matter how good you are, you're going to fail a bunch of times. And the key to me being a successful player and team is to execute when the game is on the line. When you get the guy, a player on second and third base with less than two outs, you got to find a way to get him in. That's important. And then with someone on third base with two outs, you got to get some of those runners to come in. And on the defensive end, you have to make plays in crucial situation to kill a rally. That's how you win championships, you know? And it takes encouragement from all of your teammates pulling all for one and one for all. I mean, I remember that cry when I was coming up, all for one and one for all. And when you do that, you just miss, we gave a million dollars away and you won't be able to. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. When people show up late, they miss out on the, on the glory. You got me? 
I was big when I coach on people showing up on time. I was, it was, it was a tradition that, you know, because if you have to be in surgery and the doctor show up on time, your life is what? See, that's, and people don't look at it that way, but in reality it is. That's really what it is. You could be that doctor that saved that person's life, but a doctor show up late and you, you go away on the table because the doctor didn't come up on time. So why don't you start looking at it for what it is? You know, try to get on time, here on time. You don't want to miss out on something that might be sick. You can't ever get it back. <clears throat> you know, now I, I'm saying it, I hate to say it with the coach here, but this is what I do. I tell the truth. This is what I do. And I always say to my players, a lie will help you. A lie is going to help you, but it's going to hurt you. It's going to help you, but it's going to hurt you. The truth is going to hurt. The truth is going to hurt, but it's going to help you. The truth hurts, but it helps. And that's the way it is. That lie is going to help you. But down the road, that's when it's going to hurt you. The truth is going to hurt you right here. But down the road, that's when it's going to help you. See, because in time, and you all are very young people. You all are accustomed to everything happening now. But in real life, it doesn't happen that way. That's not real. It takes time. You all came out of your mother's belly. You all didn't just get and be. It took time to get where you all are. You know, I look at myself. And people give up. If I had given up, I didn't get to go to school. I was, I grew up in a system that discriminated against black people. You know, I was, I didn't get to go to school. I wasn't speaking English. And I never got to go to first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade. I didn't get to do those things. I was in the field working, picking cotton, sugar cane. And finally, around 12 years old, I convinced my daddy to let me go to school. And Lord, I wasn't prepared. Or oh, it was a struggle for him to, to let me go. But he did. <laughs> he let me go. And then the challenge was over. I went in the kids. You know how kids do. They laugh at you when you can't do stuff. Am I right? They don't know better. That's why if you want to find something that's real, bring a kid in. <laughs> they tell you what they see. So the, I, and I realized I was hurt. And a lot of the people who came from my area who went to school, they quit because they couldn't take kids laughing at them, teasing them. I was the one person. I would go home and say, they're right. They're right. I can't read. I can't talk right. I don't look right. I was, I just didn't look right. And that's part of when you can't read, you can't write, you don't talk. Your physical appearance become a part of what is happening in you. If it, if it makes sense to you, you got me? I had no confidence. But I always had the understanding that they were right about me. And I did something. I don't know why it happened. I said, I'm going to read the paper. I ran one mile to get a newspaper, one mile back. What was unique about that is that the man who had the newspaper passed right in front of my house. Just think about that. Why would not just go to the man and give him that dime and get the newspaper? It would have made sense to most people. Why would you run one mile, go get it, and a mile back? I was different. I knew that I wanted to embark and be an athlete and I had to build endurance. Remember, only sport I played was picking cotton and doing sugar cane. I had never played any sports until I was 13 years old. But I had to do the reading stuff. And I, I got socially promoted. I don't know if you all know what socially promotion means. You go to school, they just pass you if you show up. You don't have to earn anything. 
That's what happened in my case. And it was a terrible thing. It was terrible to do such a thing. I didn't know any better. I was just happy until I really got, well, I had to be able to prove that I could read and write and could. <coughs> but I literally taught myself. Because those teachers weren't going to waste their time with me when they had students who were doing good work and they had to prepare them to go further in life. I was stuck back in there. And I understood it. And uh, so I got a chance to improve with my basketball skill. And uh, I got cut because I was terrible. But I came back the next day and the next day and the next day. And being living in a rural area, the coach who was the coach, I had to ride with him, and he stuck me in his car, but he never said a word to me after he cut me. He just dropped me home, and every day we did that. And finally, somewhere around my next sophomore year, I got a little better. He talked to me, and a little better. But there was a situation, and let me tell you something to you, you young ladies. You need to find someone who you understand is better than you, and you have to admit your shortcomings to yourself. If you can admit them to yourself, you got a chance. Because you know who, what your shortcomings are better than anyone. Admit them to yourself and find someone you know is better than you, who may be willing to help you to improve in whatever, whatever area you're trying to improve. I found that young man in high school, in, in the 10th grade, named Lloyd Jones. A very little guy. We played basketball together, and he said, Hey, big guy, when you get here in the morning, we go out and work in the gym. Back then, the bus get us there at 7. Classes started at 8. We go in the gym, and we work, and every morning, he worked with me. And he fussed at me when he, did, he had to. And I'm going to tell you something about the man in a minute. He was demanding that I improve, and I did. And by the time I was a junior, I really got better. And then by the time I was a senior, I was really good. I even had scholarship offers, and I got one. But baseball is the sport that I didn't start playing until I was 15 years old. Just a late, remember? I was denied so many opportunities growing up, so I had no chance to concentrate on any of that stuff. Unlike you all, everybody, mother and father, they've made a tremendous amount of sacrifice financially to get you all to where you all are now. My parents didn't spend a penny, they didn't have it. So that's why I didn't play, and then 15 years old, some one of my teammates said, man, let's go out for the team. And I said, okay. Not knowing, I ended up making the team. And then I played at Southern and did very well, and then I got drafted by the Atlanta Braves. All of this happened within a seven-year period. Seven-year period. I went from being a nothing to somebody. But I did something that was extremely unique. Because I knew of my shortcomings, I practiced, I showered, I ate, and I went to my room and I studied. That was everything I did. I had no social life. I didn't want one because I knew I couldn't, I couldn't make it had I got involved in social life. So that's what I did. I did that every day. I didn't have a girlfriend until my senior year. That's the only time I felt I could squeeze out a little time. But it takes, a, it takes an understanding and accept your, your, your faith in order to, uh, to be able what you want to be. You know, most people don't want to do that. You're, most people are influenced by their friends and say, who doesn't want to stand and say, let's go party, let's go drinking. And then you go and then you get in trouble. That was never going to happen to me. Never. They couldn't convince me. There was no convincing. I was going to be in that room. But I was unique. 
I was unique. If you start thinking about how unique I was, based upon what I've told you this for, I couldn't read, couldn't write. He went to school, he was an honor roll student in his senior year, he's got two degrees, and he played pro ball, and he's coached at basketball and baseball at the college level. That is unique. That is different. Most people could never fan of doing that. But I understood something about the man. When I first got hired into coaching, coach fired two people to hire me. And he said to me, in 1980, you're going to work out and work both of them. I fired both of them to hire you. You're going to out and work both of them. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I did because he made demands. We met in, his, in my office at eight o'clock every morning on the dot. Eight o'clock on the dot. You know how hard that would be today for somebody to do that? Would you agree? Ain't gonna meet every morning at eight o'clock on the dot. Somebody going to be three, four minutes. We were there on the top. And we reverse rolled. He sat behind my desk and I sat facing him. I mean, because he wanted to meet in my office. And that's what we did. But he made demands. And I'm going to tell you a little something about demand. How good it is. Even though it's difficult. If you don't make demand on people, you'll get exactly what they want to put out. You got me? It's hard for someone to put them in on themselves. That's why other people have to throw it on them. And I'm going to give you three examples of great demands that were made and great things happened. They're all here for us to see. The Great Pyramids of Africa in Egypt. The Great Pyramid. How in the hell do you think they were be built? Because Somebody made a tremendous amount of demand. A lot of people died, but they made the demand. Let's build the pyramids. Go build them. He made demands, and then what, did, what happened? They got built. So that was one demand. The great, great emperor of China said, we're going to control our, our civilization, and we're not letting anybody in, and we ain't letting anybody out. We're going to build a great China wall that's 15,000 miles. 15,000 miles. You don't think a lot of demands were made? 15,000 miles. They control who came in and who went out for all those years. That's why China is an unknown to a lot of people. They just opened it up when Richard Nixon went there. I think it was back in 1974. I don't want to Quote me on it, but China was a, nobody could get in and out of there because that 15,000 mile wall kept them. And then the third demand that was made is closer to home. It's down in Panama. The French went in trying to build the Panama Canal. It was so difficult. They abandoned it, gave up and rain because they didn't make demands. But old Teddy Roosevelt went in, oh, our old president, and he went in and said, we got to have this pit canal built because war was a big thing back then. And it took two and a half months to go all the way around Argentina down South America to get to California, where you can get, in two weeks, you can go through the Panama Canal and get to California. Big different when you're in wartime. So he takes it the Americans and he goes in and says, we got to build it. And made tremendous demand. And what happened? They built it. The walls, the uh, canal was built. I've seen it. That's out of all the three. I've never been to Egypt. I've never been to China. But I've been to Panama and I went and saw the canal. What a great, they do this, use it the same way today. That's when it opened in 1913. It's used the exact same way. They walk the ships through. One ship is here, one is down here. The water comes out, and this is how they walk them through. The 
It's just an amazing. So if you, as y'all grew up and ever get a chance, go see that. It's just amazing to see how they walk. The ships are literally in the sky. How they walk them through that water. I mean, the water, they take all the water, the water comes out, I don't know how it comes out, and goes into the other one, and this is how they do it. You know, so it's a wonderful thing. So when coaches start making demand on you all, don't complain. It's going to help you. And it's going to help the team. Because that's the only way you're going to be good if demands are leverage. <coughs> you know, if you're a challenge. Now, I know women are a little different than men. We have to admit that. Because we are born different. We are, we are created physically different. And mentally we are different. So we have to take all of that into consideration when we are making demand. I always like people to look at me too, dear. Okay. Uh, we always, you know, have to take that into consideration because emotionally women are going to be a little more emotional about things you say to them and how I say it. You might fuss, but you can't fuss in an ugly way that is going to harm the mental capacity not to think and get a job done. You got me? With men, you could yell and call them a lot of things. <laughs> Y'all have boyfriend and maybe every night. <laughs> you say something to them, to them, but you see what I'm saying? They could take it a lot easier, but they better not say anything ugly to the ladies. So when we are, so when we are, uh, when coaches are coaching you, all they're not trying to be ugly when they're trying to demand and make demands on you to get something done. It happens. It comes out. You have to be like the duck, like the water roll right off, okay? You have to let it go off of you. Because the coaches are trying to get you in the moment. Because they're imperfect, too. Don't expect the coaches to be perfect and you being perfect. And he accept you, accept him or her the same way you want them to accept you. It's a two-way street. I had you know, I have to tell a story. When I was coaching my son, he goes to, he went to the school on, on Southern's campus, uh, the high school, and he was a young kid. He was probably in the seventh, eighth grade. And, one day I was up in there fussing at the players and I said something I probably shouldn't say. So we're in our car driving home and he said, Dad, yes, son. He said, you were awful ugly today to the boys. I said, really? He said, Dad, I want you to apologize to them tomorrow. Tony's kids say the Tony's things. He said, I want you to apologize to them. Well, what do I do? I apologize because you're a young kid understood that I had gone way too far. And being the kind of person I am, I do listen because I know I made a lot of mistakes. You know what I'm saying? And I listen to myself. So if your teammates say something to you, you better listen because they're watching. If they're saying you're not hustling, you better listen to them. It's better for the teammate to say it rather than the coaches to tell it to you. And teammates, you have to chastise each other when you know that they can give better effort, make plays, but encourage at the same time. You know, a little tap on the shoulder. Come on, let's go. We could do it. All of those things are part of winning. You tear bridge down, but you got to build them up. You know? And that's what assistant coaches are for, by the way. If the coach... If you break them down, you better go behind them and build them back up. Because that's what you got to do. That's called teamwork. It's a team. So you can't, you can't participate in what he's doing, the same thing. If he's up in the air, you better be on solid ground. <laughs> you got me? Because the young ladies are going to need someone to let them know everything is all right. Everything is all right. That's how you win. You build a tradition. When this group leaves, they'll pass it along to the next group coming in. They'll tell them about what you expect from the coaches. 
You know, my older players used to say to the young man, man, coach, don't play coach anymore. He says that kind of stuff all the time. See, you need players telling players that. They're going to trust the players. It's a trust factor. You know, they're going to trust the players going to tell them the right thing. So keep all of that in mind. I know I've talked a lot. I love talking about 15 minutes, but it's such a beautiful, well-respected, attentive group of young ladies. I don't get to talk to young ladies that much. I get to talk to guys. But it's beautiful. It's a good diversion. I was really excited when they asked me because it's different. All the years of me coaching, I never had this opportunity. Just young ladies. I've talked to young ladies, but in a group of, with boys and, you know, but just young ladies. And I didn't say what's guys, did I? <laughs> like that guy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the difference. I recognize you all are young ladies. And it's a beautiful group of young ladies. And the most important thing is not winning, girls. Let me make sure you understand. Well, winning is important. It's how you play the game. It's the effort you give is the most important thing. Because you're going to give your very best on this and you're going to come out on the short end of the stick. That's just the way it happens. But if you give your very best effort and you work on the thing the coaches put out there for you to work on and get better, and you try to execute them, that's, that's winning, a winning formula. That's a winning formula. It doesn't matter if you look like 15 or 16 like those two ladies look. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You know, I worry if your mothers know where y'all are. You sure you ain't run away from home? <laughs> but uh, that's all it is. Just try to work on trying to get better at what the coaches, coaches are trying to get you all to do and execute. I entertain any question if somebody has a question. I know ladies do ask questions. There's no need to be ashamed. There is no dumb or crazy question. I had a teacher in college say there's no such thing as a dumb question. Because if you need to know something or you need clarification, you can always ask and get a question. Yes, ma'am. What was your biggest motivation and what helped you like stay out of your head? What is what? The biggest motivation what? You, your biggest motivation, like just to keep you going, and then what would like help you stay out of your head? To like remember like I'm here for a reason. Like Well, where I came from. You got to understand I came from a really situation you could never want to go back to. That was motivation. You couldn't afford to fail. And you, you, got, you all would never understand where you work in a situation where you're working for free and you had no say so. I mean, that's what I grew up under. That kind of, I know most of y'all can't fan on this, but I grew up where in the, in, in the South where if you were black, you had no say so. And I was a little different from all of the people in that area because I wanted to be different. And I was threatened by white people because they thought that I was a problem. And I truly, I was not a problem. I just wanted to get out. And that was really a big, a big thing. So I was motivated by that, uh, by that situation. And it made me, a, it kept me going. That's why I had an agenda. I wasn't gonna get off of that road to food, go party when I knew I couldn't afford to. And, and I wanted to make my daddy proud that he gave up the only thing he knew how to do so he could let me go to school. You know, my, my mother died at the, when uh, the first month I went to college, she died. So she didn't get to see it, but my father got to see it. He got to see me play pro ball and he knew he made the right decision. You see, and he saw me coach, he saw me play college baseball and he saw me coach and he gave me the okay, he said, you're doing it the right way, boy. So that's my motivation. Never could go back. 
I know somebody else had their hand up. Don't be afraid. I was just going to ask where you're from. Well, from <laughs> Ventress, Louisiana, near New Roads. Mm -hmm. The accent is Haitian. And that's what I was, like I said, I spoke Creole growing up. So my, no matter where I am, people know I'm, I have a different accent. I was telling Mr. White, I was at the airport in San Diego, California. And I was talking and someone said, that's got to be Coach Kadar. We're in San Diego, California. I picked up the red phone and dialed just a minute ago. He's laughing and hung it up and the call. And the lady said, I said, hello. I was talking. She says, is this Coach Kadar? The lady working the pool. I don't know. <laughs> when you have an accent, I can't do anything wrong. I got to do right. You got me? I can't afford two things. People know who I am. I'm tall and my voice, so I have to do the right thing or I'll be in trouble. And I think that's good to be that way. <laughs> Somebody else got a question. Ask me how old I am. I'm just joking. Somebody got a question. I mean, I'm curious. Who is the one? Yes, ma'am. I'm curious now. Can you say yes? I'm 72. But I'm, a, I'm not a, a really 72. I know some people who are 50 and they're older than me. So I'm not a 72 year old guy. I would have never guessed. Huh? I would have never guessed. Yeah, I'm not 72. I'm only that in age. Yeah, you know, and most people, you know, I, I tell you, I'm young. And I love being around young people. That's why I love my player, because I wasn't a traditional coach. I really was not a traditional coach. My players loved me because I was one of them when I had to be, you got me? After we made them in, we've done the preparation, and I know that they're prepared, we can let our hair down a little. You know, because I knew I had prepared them, you know? And I always talk trash. When I say trash, I would talk things to them when I was coaching third base in the dugout. I would say things to them, keep them loose, you know? And uh, so that's really what I did. That was, that was an evil laugh. Huh? That, that laugh had something up your sleeve. Matter of fact, when we were on TV, when we played TV games, they love putting the mic on me because they said, we know you're going to say something that we never going to hear again. You know, so I was always smiling because of what I did. And, you know, and it, that have led me to be able to do color analyst work. I've done it with cops. I've done some minor league baseball, college baseball, and I do. Uh, I'm doing the SWAC tournament. Be the color analyst for that. So, because of all my experience with the mic and being a little different, a lot of coaches are tight-lipped. They, I'm a, I was different. <laughs> I'm messing with you, okay? I'm picking on you. Yeah. You know, in every group, there's somebody that they, they pick on. And, uh, and I don't know if young ladies are like you and me, and sometimes guys can be very horrible with someone they pick on. And it could hurt people's feelings. And I would always come to the rescue. If, if they picked on the person, the only way he's wanted that person next to him is because I wanted to let the boys know I had his back. Yes, sir. Coach, I got a question. Uh, this is Coach Sewer's first year and uh, instilling. His first a, year? Mm hmm. First year here. So, instilling the system, can you recall back to when it was your first year as a, a baseball coach and putting in a culture and getting players to buy into the, where that culture ultimately kept you being successful? and what it took for the players to buy into that? Well, what I did, because I, I played with Atlanta Braves, I went to Atlanta and uh, I got with, because I knew for teaching was gonna be catching, pitching and infield was gonna be the most difficult. 
and I went in and talked with them at length. I spent seven days there. Back then, you could go into the clubhouse with no problem, and we would go over the situation, talk to the great Bob Gibson, uh, was the pitching coach with Atlanta then, and Joe Turi was the manager, and, uh, and talk about pitching, infield, and Biff Prokhorov was a guy I played with about catching. So I went and got, because remember, I got out of baseball in 77. I hadn't done anything in baseball until they asked me in 84, that was seven years. And uh, so I wanted to brush up. And remember, being a player and a coach is two different things. When you're a player, you're learning your position. Now I have to know all of the position. I knew how I feel relatively well because I played all three of them, I knew first base. So that's why I went to the infielder, pitcher, and catcher so I could get more information on what I could need to work on. So you, I would find some, I don't know how long you coach them on high school level or what, but if there is some really good clinic where softball is being, that's where you can pick up a lot of ideas. The thing I try to really make coaches understand, don't put too much on the kid, keep it simple. You gotta understand, it's like trying to feed a baby a lobster. You can't, <laughs> ain't gonna eat it. You can't eat that lobster, okay? So, simplicity is gonna work. If you keep it simple, something they can do and achieve success. You 400 mile power, keep putting it on top and they can't master it. They're going to be disappointed. They're going to be insecure. They're not going to do a good job. And that's what I did in my first few years. I kept everything extremely simple. Well, throughout my coaching career, nothing. I never had a pickup move at second. I didn't work on that. I ain't work on trying to pick someone off on second base. You will have more mistakes happen. You got me? Because we didn't have the right people to execute it, so I didn't do it. I stayed with the thing, work on cutoff and relays, rundowns, how to run the bases, hit and run. Those are the things that you're going to do all the time in baseball. Am I agree? I don't know if they hit and run in softball. But, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> but cut off and relays, you gotta work on those things. Base running, I work, I spent a lot of time on that. Because those are the main things that you do on the baseball field when you're playing the game. So it's not that hard. Just go to the thing that you do the most on the baseball field, softball field, and work on it. And that's the best way to do it. That's what I did. Did it for 33 years and it worked. Because my players knew how to do it. They were confident how to do it, you see. And the most time you're gonna spend is on hitting because that's the most difficult thing, part of the game. Trying to hit a rod object with a rod object squarely. That's hard. That's the most, so you spend more time hitting and then feeling, hitting, you know, we feel feel a lot of balls. Not necessarily throwing them, but feeling them. See, because you don't want to tie your arms up. So we used to hit two, three hundred ground balls down infielders every day. And they just catch and put them in the bucket. That way and they work on their mechanic, that front of and all of that. But you gotta catch the ball first. The thing I taught too why you want to run hard to first base. Listen to this, ladies. The reason you run hard to first base on a ground ball, that fielder got to catch it. That fielder has to throw it. Somebody got to catch it. And the umpire got to make a call. Four things got to happen. That's why you run hard. How many people ever think about that? Four things happen if you hit ground balls. They got to catch it. They have to throw it. They have to catch it. And the umpire got to make the call. I taught that and I won a championship that we had lost. 
I preached that the whole year. Boy, run hard on the ground ball. Every day I preached it. Run hard on the ground ball. We're going to win a championship that way. Elimination game in it for the conference championship. The slowest guy I got a senior hits a ground ball to shortstop. Routine. And he, he bought into what I said all like that. <laughs> Great hard. He's out this much. And what happens? With two outs, umpire calls him safe. The stadium blew up because everybody knew he was out. <laughs> so, he's, so the next guy fought with pitches, pass ball, he gets the second. And the next boy hits a dribbler between first and second into right field. We score tied the game. And won it the next inning, and then the next day we won two games to win the championship. So I'm telling you, preach something every day that you know they can do. They can run hard. May not be the fastest one, but just run hard. <laughs> it, could lead you, <laughs> it could lead you to a championship. I can say one of my 14 championships were won that way. It was lost, and we won it. You got to run hard on everything. <clears throat> You'll find out you'll force them to make a mistake. You'll win games that way. You're not going to win a ton of games, but you can win some games that way. And the game could be important. You never know. But if you don't run home, we know what's going to happen. You're going to be called out. Remember, the coaches are looking for effort. I don't care what coach you have. They're looking for effort. Give them effort. And you'll make your teammates proud too. You know, they'll say, look at Sue Jane or Mary Jo. Look at her. She's running home. <laughs> I love having fun. <laughs> I'm not 72. I love having fun. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Yes, Coach? Yesterday you talked about, I heard on the show, you talked about perseverance and just never giving up in the course of that. Um, I think you kind of covered that today. Um, you also talked a little bit about when you were first got to Southern Bay, you had no facilities or no um, none of that stuff. Just what would you tell student athletes who don't have those things? Well, we, we don't have those. Yes. <laughs> when, when, when I took over in August of 1984, everything baseball had was in a shop, grocery shopping basket. You know what a grocery shopping basket, everything was in there. And I got in there and took a deep breath. I knew I had a challenge. And I went in, and uh, obviously, Dusty Baker, who was the manager of the Astros, is a personal friend. I, we've been friends for 50 years. We played together with the Braves. And he first, the first one helped me to get equipment. But as it relates to facilities, we used to practice on the football practice field. We didn't even have a place to practice. And the thing I told my players, don't worry about what you don't have. Only be concerned with what you do have. And what you do have is an opportunity to be here. And we are going to do good. It led me to say in 1985, I told those kids, only practice football field. When history is written, when history is written, you guys are going to be a part of history. And we had nothing. And they sort of believed me. They trusted what I said had validity. A year later, we go out and beat Cal State Fullerton, the number one team. With no facility. No facility. What we did with our batting cage, <laughs> that's an interesting. I don't know if you ever watched TV where they had the people on carrying a cross and they were. You ever seen the movie where people carrying stuff on their shoulders? 
what, what we did, we had a makeshift band cage, but we wanted to move it and put it over, under the overpass at Southern because we could hit when it rained or if it hot, we could still hit under there. So we dug it out of the ground and it had some little piece of concrete at the bottom. And the kids put this thing on their shoulders and they carried them under the overpass. I, I wish I had film to show. But these were different kids. These were 1980s kids in the 80s. They trusted anything I said. You know, they trusted it because they could see what I was telling them made sense. It's a little more difficult for you all to do this because kids are different. They've had beautiful facilities, but it doesn't mean y'all can't be successful here just because you came out of facilities. Here's what you do in the field at the end of the day that matters. I have never seen a facility made a person yet, made a player. It's the player. It has nothing to do with facilities. I produce all those great players with no facility. What does it say? Parents trusted me, the kids wanted to play for me, and they played hard. I gave them direction, I made demands, and they went out and did, delivered on the demand. And you know what? They are damn happy that I made demands on them now that they're parents, husbands, leaders in the community. They are damn happy because life is a lot easier for them because of the demands I made on them. They can see the light. So if you, nobody ever make demand on you, you're not going to amount to very much because there are disappointments so much out there. So, and not having facilities, coach, doesn't keep them from uh, achieving at great height if they want to work hard, you know. All the kids in the Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Panama and Colombia, they ain't got no facilities. They play on gravel, rocked, feel up. It's, it's really how hard you want to work. Let's not make excuses to keep us from being good. Let's not take use not having a facility for not being good. Because that's not the reason you're not going to be good. Okay? That facility is there for what its purpose is, but it, I've never seen a facility make anybody better. I see kids come out of facility that is big league. They can't play. They don't make them. It's not the facilities. You know, but I know what is shining to the eyes is what people want. Shiny things. They want the shiny things that's in their eyes. But that ain't what's gonna make you good. <clears throat> you all are fortunate to be at a really nice school here, PRCC. This really is a nice school. It's clean, clean, you know. And you all in a good city. They got good food here <laughs> in Baton Rouge. You don't like the food? Where you from, Kaplan? I never said that. <laughs> huh? I didn't say that. No, she, I'm talking to her. Oh, I'm talking. Where are you from? Plaquemine. Plaquemine. The food is better in Plaquemine than Baton Rouge? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> Last thing, Coach, before you go, talk about preparation. Well, <laughs> let me say something about that. I learned something very valuable. In 1970, I walked into the training room at Southern, and there was a sign in different colors on the wall. Preparation meets opportunity. Three words. Preparation meets opportunity. It caught my eyes, my eyes, and I got excited. Preparation meets opportunity. Well, my son gets angry with me, I guess, when I tell him that. Because I often tell them about, let me tell you something about preparation, son. If you're prepared, you'll see what's coming in front of you. You'll know and you'll be able to grab and take advantage of it. 
But if you're not prepared, a lot of opportunities gonna come and go, and you will never, never know that they came or even happened. That's why you gotta be prepared. If you, that's why it says preparations meets opportunity. Opportunities happen every second of the day. But we, many times we're not prepared to take advantage of them. Just go write it down somewhere, please. You, it'll make a difference in your life. Three words, preparation meets opportunity. That person who is griping about not playing, prepare yourself, because you're gonna get that opportunity. That's why you gotta prepare. If, you get, if you're griping, you're not prepared, give it to you, what's gonna happen, you're gonna fail. In a game of failure anyway. But they're watching. I had a same when I coached. I see everything. You know, I was always watching the kids far away from it to see who's working, who is not working. And I would always yell out, I'm looking. I see who is working. Wanted to keep them encouraged, keep working. <clears throat> you know, because you may not be working right here with this group, but you can still prepare yourself here. So when you get here, see, that's why preparation meets opportunity is so important. Write it down, please, ladies. Preparation meets opportunity. It's true. You tell me, find me somebody who said it ain't true, I'll give them $1,000. You want to say it's not true? <laughs> 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 okay. Hey, listen, ladies. Uh, I appreciate y'all letting me come and take up your time. I would give y'all money just to have this opportunity. You don't want it? No. Ooh! <laughs> I don't think you should pay this person. Huh? No, that doesn't make sense. You okay, dear? You okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you.